Well, this is a, um, a sermon series that I've been looking forward to, um, talking about God's game plan, not just for our lives, but for our congregation and, and where and how God is calling us to move in the world. Now, um, over the summer, we started um, kind of an intentional uh, exploration of who we are and who God has called us to be as a congregation. We talked about our core values, um, compassion, authenticity, discipline, service, generosity. Uh, We talked last in the last sermon series, Great Expectations, about how as people of faith, we have expectations for our lives and that God has expectations for us in the world. And then in this sermon series, Game Plan, we're going to talk about specific strategies that God wants us and is calling us to use to grow in our faith, to grow in our relationship with God, and to impact the world one life at a time. So today we're going to talk about the vision that God has, um, how expansive and important that vision is. Next week we're going to talk about discipleship and growing in our relationship with Christ. Then we're going to talk about how important connection and community is in in our formation and in being the people that God has called us to be. and then we're going to end at the sermon series talking about worship and how important celebration is, um, not just as a place to come on Sunday morning or over a weekend, but how strategic God uses music and celebration and worship uh, for the purpose of the kingdom and for the, for the mission that God has. Now, you know, when we talk about teams and, and competition and even as an individual, Going into a competition, there's a plan, a strategy. Um, Yesterday, you know, football, at least for college, kicked off, uh, no pun intended. And uh, and it was a glorious day for some because those strategies worked. And it was not so glorious of a day for others because those strategies didn't work. And um, my for my team, they didn't work either. So it's it's a it's a way to think about that. And this morning, to talk about God's dream and God's vision uh, for, for our lives and for even for us as a congregation, I want to use Exodus chapter 3. Uh, this is a story in the Old Testament. It's a story about Moses. Some, are you for, some of you may be familiar with it uh, because it's the story or the beginning of the story in which Moses engages the burning bush. Now, just a little bit of context. Uh, Moses um, is a Hebrew. He, um, his mother, for the sake of saving his life, um, set him adrift on a river. He was picked up by, by Egyptian royalty, raised uh, within the Pharaoh's home, um, grew up that way. When he came of age, he saw how the, the Egyptians were oppressing and being very um, violent toward the Hebrews, his people at that time. And when he came of age, that passion um, stirred in his soul. He acted on that passion, um, took the life of an Egyptian soldier or taskmaster who was torturing or or beating an Israelite slave. He exiled himself from Egypt, moved across the desert, found a new life in Midian, started a life there, found a new wife, a new family, um, and began to shepherd flocks of sheep there. And then one day while he was shepherding this flock out in the mountains, um, he came across a burning bush. And this burning bush was not being consumed. And God called to him out of that burning bush and called him to a specific mission and a specific work. And so I want to kind of share just a few verses of that. Exodus chapter 3. Verses 1 through 12. You can see that in your bulletins. You can follow along on the screen. But allow me to share this word with you. It said, Moses was taking care of the flocks for his father-in-law Jethro, Midian's priest. He led his flock out to the edge of the desert and he came to God's mountain called Horeb. The Lord's messenger appeared to him in a flame of fire in the middle of a bush. Moses saw that the bush was in flames, but it didn't burn up. Then Moses said to himself, let me check out this amazing sight and find out why the bush isn't burning. When the Lord saw that he was coming to look, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses said, I'm here. Then the Lord said, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals because you are standing on holy ground. He continued, I am the God of your father, Abraham's God, Isaac's God, and Jacob's God. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And then the Lord said, I've clearly seen my people oppressed in Egypt. I've heard their cry of injustice because of their slave masters. I know about their pain. 
I've come down to rescue them from the Egyptians in order to take them out of that land and bring them to a good and broad land, a land that's full of milk and honey, a place where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites all live. Now the Israelites' cries of injustice have reached me. I've seen just how much the Egyptians have oppressed them. So get going. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I to go to Pharaoh and to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I'll be with you. And this will show you that I'm the one who sent you. After you bring the people out of Egypt, you will come back here and worship God on this mountain. Let us pray. Gracious God, this morning... Um, Lord, we come into this place, God, drawn, um, Lord, by the desire and the call to worship, to lift up our lives, to lift high your name, God, to celebrate who you are and, God, how you have worked in our lives and in the lives of so many, God, for centuries. Lord, we pray that in this moment, in this holy space, God, that we would hear you call our name, that you would call us to a place of holiness, a place of richness and mercy, and God, a place in which through our lives, God, you were able to continue to bring hope, mercy, justice, and freedom. Lord, we lift all these things up to you, and we pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. So I came across a story a, a couple months ago as I was thinking about this morning. And it's an old story. It's, it's happened a long time ago, and it, it took place on one long evening there was a search committee that was looking for a new pastor. They'd been going over resume after resume in hopes of finding the perfect minister. None so far. Tired of the whole process, they were about ready to call it a night when they came upon this letter of introduction from a candidate. It read, To the pulpit nominating committee, It is my understanding that you are in the process of searching for a new pastor, and I would like to apply for the position. I wish I could say that I am a terrific preacher, but I can't. Actually, I stutter when I speak. I wish I could say that I have an impressive educational background, but again, I can't. No college or seminary, just the school of hard knocks. I wish I could say I bring a wealth of experience to the job, but I can't. I've never been a pastor before unless you count the flock of sheep I've been shepherding. I wish I could say I have wonderful pastoral skills, but again, not really. Sometimes I lose my temper and I've been known to get violent when upset. Once I even took the life of somebody, but gracious folks that you are, I am certain you will not hold that against me. I know churches these days want young ministers to attract young members, and I wish I could say that I'm young, but again, not really. I'm almost 80, but I still feel young. With all that which might go against me, why am I applying for your position? Simple. One afternoon recently, the voice of God spoke to me and said, I had been chosen to lead. <laughs> I admit I was a bit reluctant when I had first heard it at first too. But here I am. I look forward to hearing from you and to leading you into an exciting new future. Yours sincerely. The pulpit committee members looked at one another. The chairperson asked, well, what do you think? The rest of the committee was aghast. A stuttering, uneducated, inexperienced, arrogant, old, obviously neurotic ex-murderer is their pastor? Somebody must be crazy. The chairperson eyed them all around the table before she said, It's signed, Moses. When I read that story, I, I think the last line of that really got to me. All of the reasons why in a perfect world he, Moses would never have truly been considered as someone who had been given the opportunity to lead um, not just a congregation, not just a band of people, maybe not even some sheep, but, but even to be leading the people, his people, the Israelites out of Egypt. Every qualification that we would have checked off a resume would have been empty when it would have come to Moses. Yet Moses is the one that God calls to be able to lead his people who had been in slavery for centuries under the Egyptians to lead them into a land of milk and honey, to lead them into a place of freedom. You know, sometimes I wonder in my own heart, 
you know, who is this God that we serve that whenever given such an awesome opportunity, such a grand vision of, of leading people into freedom, of, of ushering in the kingdom, of, of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ, how each and each or any one of us could be chosen for such a great task, for something that requires so much, for something that calls upon us and, and, and calls us into places that will make us uncomfortable and unsure, uncertain, and, and sometimes even afraid. Who is this that, that God would call us to be able to live into the midst of that? And I, I would think that as, as Moses was sitting there around that bush and, and, and listening to God call him, I can only imagine all of the emotions that he felt, everything that was coming into play at that moment, for he had left so much of that behind him when he had moved to Midian. He had started a new life. He was in a good place. His kids were in good schools. He had gotten a nice house. He had gotten the promotion. He, was, he had put all that other stuff behind him, and now he was doing good. And yet, even in the midst of that moment, even in the midst of everything that he had been through, God sought him out. Because I'm sure in Moses' mind, there were so many reasons why he was definitely not the person that God needed to call into that moment. I came across a slide. It made me smile whenever I saw it. It says, you know, God talks to you, but says the last thing you want to hear. You know, sometimes we say, God, speak to us. God, tell me what you want. God, just tell me and we'll do it. God, just call me by name and I'll respond. And we await most of the time hoping that God's going to give us a safe, safe calling that's in line with our lives and achieves and, and parallels the same goals that we have. But what happens when God calls our name and it's the last thing we want to hear? What happens when God calls our names and God sends us into places that we had hoped we would never return? What, what happens when God calls us in such a way that it takes the, the, the experience of our life, the great things and even the painful things, and God sets us into a place to be able to share the richness of his mercy, to lead people to freedom, and to offer people the opportunity to know him? What happens when God's calling speaks to us in a way that it's the last thing that we want to hear? I can only imagine Moses on that mountain. I, I thought about it the other day. I went to go get some gas over at, 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 um, at the Kroger here off 407. And, um, and I don't know about you, but I pulled up there to, to, to put gas in my car, and I all of a sudden realized that there were people there that wanted to sell me something. Right? You've, you've seen this. You, maybe you have or maybe you haven't. Uh, you may go to a different gas station than I do. But, you know, whenever I, when I got out, they had on pink suits, and you could tell. And, and I could see them kind of hovering around other people's cars, trying to catch people's eyes. And before people could say no, they'd spray something on their car and wipe it off and try to, you know, they're, they're there to do a job. They're there to sell something. And I was doing everything in my power not to look at them. I was looking around. And I, I knew that I was caught, and so, and so I was trying to look away. And they know, they just, they can smell the desperation on you, right? And so two of them kind of lock eyes on me, and they start walking around my car. And I'm like, Lord Jesus, please, what do I need to do? And then all of a sudden I thought, oh. And so I jumped in my truck and closed the door and just started texting. I wasn't even texting. I was just looking down. And I could see them. One of them, one of them put their hand on my truck, and I'm like, oh, no, I'm not looking. Mm-mm. And they moved on. You know, I can imagine Moses there on that mountain. You know, he was, you know, he was, he had done everything that he needed to do. He moved to a place where he was safe. He just wanted to live his life. He just wanted to do what he thought he needed to do. He just wanted to put all of that behind him. But you know what? God came to him in a bush that was burning, and he, God came to him in a way that he couldn't ignore it. And I can only imagine Moses says, I'm not going to look. I'm not going to do it. But he couldn't help. He was drawn to it. And God called him. And he called him over to that place. And, and as he approached that burning bush, he said, stop. He said, take off your, your sandals because right now you're on holy ground. And I don't know about you, but sometimes my life moves so fast that, that I don't always pay attention to the holy ground that God can call me to sometimes. And I don't, I don't know about you, but sometimes I can be so busy doing the work of God that sometimes I'm not always aware of the presence of God. And as he approached that holy place and, and asked, 
and was asked to take off his sandals. And I can imagine that when he stepped onto that sand and his feet and his life were vulnerable and exposed and he was right there in the presence of God, I can only imagine how powerful and palpable that moment was for him. It took me back to a, to a passage in Ephesians chapter 2. And I just want to share it with you. It's not on the screen. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, However, God is rich in mercy. He brought us to life with Christ while we were dead as a result of those things that we did wrong. He did this because of the great love that he has for us. You were saved by God's grace. And God raised us up and seated us in the heavens with Christ Jesus. God did this to show future generations the greatness of his grace by the goodness that God has shown us in Jesus. You are saved by God's grace because of your faith. The salvation is God's gift. It's not something you possessed. It's not something you did that you can be proud of. Instead, we are God's accomplishment, created in Jesus to do good things. God planned for these good things to be the way that we live our lives. However, God is rich in mercy. I can only imagine that whenever Moses came to that place and stepped onto that holy ground, that holy moment in which he was around that burning bush, that the richness of God's grace and mercy was present for him. And I can only imagine the emotions that, that Moses had carried with him all his life. Maybe the resentment and the regret, maybe the pain, the guilt or the shame that had just been the, the, the chains that had held him and bound his heart and his life. How he had lived in a place in which he had felt so unworthy and so unsure of what God could do with him or how God could use him or what that would mean yet in that mercy when he in that moment when he stepped into the presence of God's rich mercy that God met him there and bathed him in grace and said it's not about being perfect it's not about being good enough it's not about having all the answers it's not about being a religious professional it's not about being a religious perfectionist it's not about having it all together it's about being obedient to my call and you are mine and i call you by name You know, sometimes it's easier to avoid God. Sometimes it's easier not to really seek out holy places and holy moments and holy space because sometimes in those moments we have to be vulnerable and exposed and authentic in the presence of God. And sometimes we're not ready to accept God's grace. Sometimes we're not ready to believe that we need God's grace. Sometimes our pride and ego are too strong, yet sometimes God calls us in such a way that we can't ignore it and we have to, we have to go. We have to be brought near to it and we long for it. Sometimes we, we put on the show all week long and when we come to worship we sing the songs and we feel the presence of God and it stirs and moves within us and we know that God loves us oh, that rich and deep mercy that God pours out for us that we long for and not only does God pour out that mercy, God does not only does God make that available to us for us to drink deeply, but God also gives us the chance to pour that out into the world. And you know what? It's not just for things that happen in the church. All of us have chances in which God redeems and moves. And those holy moments can be in office spaces or in cubicles. Those holy moments can be at lunch or at coffee. Those holy moments can be on the field or they can be, I mean, you know, wherever they are. They can be moments where God can call you and use you to share that deep mercy and that richness of God's blessing with people around you. Because more and more, I see over and over again just how many people need that and don't have any source of it in their lives. One of the things I, I really try to do in my life um, especially initially whenever I move in the world because the church is moving to a place that's not quite in the center of culture anymore. And so whenever you tell people you're a pastor, they don't always know what to do with you, right? Sometimes there's just, sometimes there's just outright guilt or sometimes people aren't sure. Sometimes they start telling you their religious history and the last time they attended church. And, you know, people just have weird feelings about pastors in general. You know, I don't know, Sarah, probably not you, but for me they do. And so, so a lot of times I don't really start off and, and share that initially. Sometimes I just listen. And, um, and I had the chance to, to sit with one of my instructors at the gym uh, one day after working out. And, um, and we were just having a conversation. And, and, and she just was telling me just about some of the struggles um, she was having with, with one of her daughters. 
And, and I remember just looking at her as we kind of sat there, as everybody kind of filed out. And I, and I just remember looking over at her, and I just looked her in the eye, and I said, listen, I just want you to know, you're a good mom. You're a good mom. And it got really quiet, and she didn't say anything. And I thought, oh, there I go. I said something uncomfortable and weird and awkward. And who knows what's going to happen next. And then she just looked up with tears in her eyes, and she said, thank you. She said, I, sometimes it's easy for me to forget. And I think how many of us each and every day need people in our lives to say, listen, you're a good father. You're a good husband. You're a good mother. You're a good wife. You're a good daughter. You're a good son. You're a good student. You're a great teacher. You're a phenomenal musician. You are good and you are worthy of God's love. How many of us wander each day having to prove ourselves and earn respect and put one foot in front of the other and to play tough all the time or to make our families and our life look good without other people seeing us sweat and how unforgiving do we feel in the world in which we live. Yet it is Christ who calls us out with this rich and deep mercy to share the good news with our co-workers, our teammates, our friends, parents, and, and, and our teachers, and our administrators, and our congregations to share this revelation of God's deep mercy. Why do we celebrate communion and we, we worship together on a weekly basis? Because we have the chance to come together to remember who we are and whose we are. To remind ourselves that there's more to life than so much of what's set before us. And that we are worthy of God's love and of God's praise. That we're worthy of, of, of unconditional grace and mercy. That we have this chance and this opportunity to receive and to be transformed and to share. Who today, when you leave this place, will you encounter when you go to lunch or when you go to go to the game or whenever you go wherever God is leading you who will you show mercy to today who will you pour out grace for today who will you have the chance to to smile at or shake their hand or look into their eyes and tell them that they are good and that they are loved who will you have the chance to do that to and for today Sometimes we think that being called by God leads us to foreign countries. We think that it leads us to grand projects. Sometimes the greatest mission and field that God calls you to is the one that you go to on Monday mornings, wherever that is. Maybe it's with the parents that you spend time with or the women that you spend time with or the exercise group that you work out with. Whoever and wherever God's called you can be holy ground on which you share God's love and grace. And maybe the truth of the matter is, maybe it's hard for you to share that because you have an allowed yourself to be in the presence of God and to soak that grace in for yourself. Maybe you feel spiritually dry and maybe you're avoiding the call of God. But my prayer is this morning as we take the bread and the cup, maybe if, if you're in a spiritually dry place, maybe if you're in a place where you haven't dropped the walls and you haven't allowed your hardened heart to be softened by God's love, that maybe when you spend a moment at the prayer rail this morning, you will allow that grace to wash over you. Maybe when you get up and you walk back to your seat and when you leave the sanctuary today and you walk out into the, into the parking lot and you get in your car and you drive somewhere, maybe you'll allow yourself to hear God's call and to see an opportunity today to share grace. I remember whenever I was, when I was a teenager, and in, a, in the first time in my life I became aware of God's love and God's presence in a life-changing way that I had never known before. And when I think back to that moment in my life, I think back to Charlene Cummings. She was my youth director at the time. And she loved me when I was difficult, to say the least. For every question that I asked, for every hard-headed comment that I made, she gave a hug. And she was the person who really was present for me when I became knowledgeable and became aware of just how much God loved me and how I would never be the same once I knew that love. Who do you know? Do you remember a time in your life when you became aware of God's love and grace? Who, do you remember that when you became aware that Jesus loves you more than anything? Do you remember that time or one of those times? And do you remember a person that, that you can attach that to? Do you remember their name? Do you? For millions of people, when they think of what freedom was like, when they think of, of when they became aware of the freedom that God offers them, the name that they speak is Moses. My hope and my prayer 
is that as we experience the fullness and the love of, of Jesus Christ this morning, that you will consider and pray that God will give you the opportunity to impact the life of even just one person. So one day, when they're sitting in a congregation or maybe having a conversation, and somebody asks them, who was the person that was present and involved when you became aware of the unconditional, unrelenting love of Jesus Christ? That they'll speak your name. Because you made an impact because you were obedient to God's call, because you allowed God to call you into moments that were holy and merciful. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. Lord, we thank you for the power of your grace, for the opportunity to be drawn into this time together. God, we thank you for all of those saints, God, who have gone on before us, and all of the people, God, who were present when we became aware of your glorious grace, the power of your love for us, God. Lord, you have called us to a vision, Lord, to, to transform the world one life at a time, to live into the fullness of who you have called us to be. God, allow us to experience that grace and mercy for ourselves. And God, allow us to be the vessels through which that grace and mercy pours out into the world around us. Because every day we cross the paths of people who are longing to know your love, who are desperate to know your grace. And may our lives be a testament to who you are. Lord, we lift all this up to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.